Have you heard about our YouTube channel? All you have to do is enter youtube.com. Once you're there, type the place of change in the search box. Be sure to press enter. And once you're there, you'll find the latest videos from Shekinah Kingdom Church, the place of change. All you have to do is enter youtube.com. Once you're there, type the place of change in the search box. Be sure to press enter. And once you're there, you'll find the latest videos from Shekinah Kingdom Church, the place of change. Good evening and welcome to Shekinah Kingdom Church. I'm Pastor Cedric Rousen and it is my pleasure to invite you into this sacred space that we call Wednesday Night Live. I'm grateful to have you here. I want you to come in, do me a favor, if you're willing to, if you're watching us live uh, on uh, social media, uh, Facebook, YouTube, or even our, our website, uh, share the link uh, or the post so that others can have an opportunity to join in who may be a part of your sphere of influence but are not a part of ours. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. We want to try to get the gospel out as far as we possibly can. If this is your first time hanging out with us, I want you to do me a favor. We welcome you. And uh, and as a result of that, I would you do me the kind favor of uh, clicking the uh, pinned comment link at the bottom of the screen that says uh, SKC uh, Connect Card. It is an e-card for our first time guests. We, it's a very small questionnaire. We just ask you to uh, take a moment and fill out so we can get in contact with you. Thank you personally for being a part of this experience and find out how we can be praying and serving you in the days to come. If you want to make a spiritual decision, if you want to give your life to Christ, if you want to join um, our church, if you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, either one of those, you can also click um, the second linked comment that will be available for you that says spiritual decision. And you can uh, click that um, pinned comment and uh, take a moment and fill out that paperwork. We want to walk you through your next steps um, in the kingdom of God. And we're really excited about the opportunity to serve you on your spiritual journey. Finally, before we get ready to go into the word, if you desire to be a blessing to the ministry, I want to personally pause and thank each of you who contribute to this ministry, who believe in this ministry and what we're seeking to do for the kingdom of God. And if you desire to contribute and to be a part um, tangibly, uh, then you can do that. There are several modalities you can use safely and electronically to do it that are at the bottom of the screen, including text to give, uh, the uh, Give Plus app upon which you can look for our church, um, and you can give right from our home base, which is our website at uh, placeofchange.org, along with a host of other things you can do from our site as well. Well, let's get ready to pray because I'm ready to go into the word of God. I've got a neat word I want to share with you tonight. And so let's have a word of prayer and then we're going to dive right into the scripture. God, we thank you tonight and we are grateful for the opportunity to gather in a cyber but sacred space. I pray tonight that as we have moments of discussion in your word, that you first and foremost would um, allow your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth. We cannot understand truth at this level without the Holy Spirit. Lord, I also pray that you will bless our time together and that you will make it worth the investment of our time by saying something to someone that their spirit needs to hear. Thank you, Lord, for these soulful moments of instruction, of revelation, and of insight. And our promise to you is that we won't just be hearers of the word only, but that we will also do what we hear. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, all right, join me tonight in uh, the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 11. I'm going to read two places eventually in the scripture, but our primary text, our focus uh, text uh, and pericope uh, is in Matthew chapter 11. And I want to just lift verses 2 through 6. Um, I don't have a very long text tonight, um, but in it we will find uh, this narrative that provides the backdrop for our 
uh, discourse in discipleship. Matthew chapter 11, beginning with verse 2, and we're going to read up to verse 6. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to them, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. That's good. He said in verse 2, Are you the one? When John was in prison, he sent a few of his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the one or should we look for another? I want to talk tonight and converse with you around the subject, the back end, the back end. I know that sounds weird and crazy, and we're trying to figure out already what, what is Pastor talking about. Well, obviously, if there's a back end, it meant there was a front end. Uh, but I want to talk about what happens on the back end and the significance of, of the back end. Now, uh, for those of you who were in tune with our um, service this past Sunday, we ended our message and there's no correlation between the, that message and this moment of, of teaching and ministering tonight. However, I will tell you uh, that we ended our message Sunday talking about Jesus and John. We were talking really about Mary and Elizabeth and these two um, unborn uh, developing babies in their wombs and the connection that brought about with these two babies as Elizabeth and Mary had a connection between the two of them. What you will find, however, is that Jesus and John will indeed be connected and will be connected for the rest of destiny, that, that even once they are born and once they are grown, there is a connection. Now, this connection isn't merely the fact that they are distant cousins. This connection is because they are destiny partners. It has been divinely ordained by God. There's a role that uh, they play in each other's lives. Specifically tonight, my focus is on John, whom the Bible calls John the Baptist. Now, Baptist doesn't mean uh, that he was, uh, uh, that's not a denomination as if to say John the Baptist or John the Pentecostal or John the Presbyterian or John the Methodist or John the Catholic. It's, it's to suggest John the Baptizer. Because the Lord used John in his ministry to introduce what I have called before a divine disruption. It was a paradigm shift and baptism became the sign by which uh, the Lord instructed John to practice as a symbol, an open symbol to those who were being, if you will, converted um, or those who embraced this message of the kingdom and those who would ultimately uh, embrace the gospel. John broke the mold, coming alive onto the scene. He didn't look or act like anybody else. Though John was the son of a priest, his father Zacharias was a priest. John was not led to follow in his father's footsteps as a priest. Rather, this priest, Zacharias, and his wife Elizabeth gave birth to a prophet. And we see the Bible telling us that John went out into the wilderness he looked kind of weird. He dressed kind of funny. The Bible says he wore camel's hair clothes, uh, that he ate locusts and wild honey, and he hung out almost like a vagabond in the wilderness. And by the time he comes of age for ministry, we find him not in the temple, not in his synagogue, not somewhere offering sacrifice or speaking in a traditional context. We see John going out into the wilderness, and he would cry out things like, repent, repent for the kingdom is near. This was a paradigm shift. Repent for the kingdom is near. It, 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 was, it was John's message. It was John's message to the people that they might understand that there was a, a paradigm shift, almost a cataclysmic eruption that was taking place in the spirit world. John is the first prophetic voice that we have heard in the scriptures in now 400 years 
And after 400 years of divine silence, we see God breaking that silence in John, coming into the earth, declaring this message to which Jesus will pick up, uh, uh, declaring for the kingdom of heaven has come. Consequently, we see that uh, the climax, if you will, of John's ministry occurs uh, as John is given the opportunity to identify Christ uh, to whom he indeed will baptize. John doesn't want to baptize Jesus. He feels he's not worthy to baptize Jesus, but Jesus tells him to do it because it fulfills scripture. And we see John baptizing Jesus in the Jordan River. And when he does, then there uh, is a voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. And we see this principle of this uh, climactic moment in John's ministry. Now I want you to turn to John chapter 1 and I know this is a deviation from our uh, text in Matthew but I want there's something very significant that I want you to see and I have to literally read it because it's so important to our lesson. I don't want you to take my word for it. Go to John chapter 1 verses 29 through 34. This is in this context where um, John the Baptist, and this John, the book of John isn't written by John the Baptist, okay? It's so two separate Johns. However, John the Baptist in this text proclaims openly an acknowledgement of who Christ is. Some verses later, he will declare that I must decrease that he may increase. John is very aware of this transition that is taking place in his life and in his ministry. And I want you to see exactly what is taking place here in... Um, in John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him. Now, this is John in the midst of preaching in his crowd, okay? Jesus was just a face in John's crowd. But the Bible says the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him. Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Now, I read that because what I want you to understand is that it is in this context that John identifies Jesus. Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He confesses out of his own mouth uh, that even though I did not know that he was the Messiah all along, he said the, that the Lord told me the one to whom you see the Spirit descend upon and remain. It is he. He said, I've got a revelation and this man right here is the one. Did you see that? Where well, he said that I have testified myself and have seen that this is the Son of God. Now, with that in mind, it makes me have to raise the awkward question then about the text we read in Matthew 11. Because the text we read in Matthew 11, you ready for this tension? Suggests in verse 2 that when John was in prison, heard what Jesus had done, he sent his disciples, John had his own uh, set of disciples, sent his disciples to go seek Jesus to ask, are you the one? Or should we look for another? Now, wait a minute, John. You testified in an earlier season that I know, I can vouch, I can verify, I can affirm that this is he. This is the Messiah, the Son of God. And yet here he is a season later asking that question, are you the one or should we look for another? And on the surface, it almost confuses us until you read the first clause of the second verse of Matthew 11, where we read. And it said, when John heard in prison, 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 what is prison? The back end. 
I'm sorry, church. This is probably better to me than it is to you and, and all of that jazz. And I apologize. I'm really, I'm really getting blessed myself from the scripture because it suggests that perhaps what we saw taking place in the gospel of John, where he's baptizing Jesus and proclaiming him, and I'm not worthy to latch at his shoes, and he's going to baptize you with fire, even though I baptize you with water. It suggests that all of these dynamics that John encountered was the front end. This all occurred on the front end, but by the time we get to this text in Matthew 11, he's on the back end. The, the front end is the place of confirmation. The back end is the place of contemplation. And the question becomes, what happens in between the front end of confirmation and the back end of contemplation that now leads me to be in a state like John where I'm asking, are you the one when a season ago I was sure? I want to suggest it's about the conflict that occurs in between, that by the time we get to this stage, John is in prison. It's not what I had in mind when I stood in that muddy Jordan River and baptized Jesus. I didn't necessarily think that that climactic moment of ministry was going to somehow land me here. Good evening to those of you who have just joined in. I'm ministering tonight from the subject, the back end, and my assignment tonight, I don't know that this is a Bible study. I don't know if it's a message, a sermon. I don't know what it is. I really feel like it's just a package I'm called to deliver and a word that I'm called to drop right at your doorstep, ring your doorbell, and get back in my truck and leave like Amazon Prime. I want to suggest tonight that for somebody listening to me, you are are a lot like John, who found yourself on the front end confident about something that now on the back end you're beginning to question. Lord have mercy. I have learned that the back end can really, really mess you up because it will make you have to wrestle with the fact that perhaps this is not what I had in my mind when I said yes from the front end. This isn't exactly how I thought this would be going down. See, people who are only on the front end don't really impress me. I don't really want to take advice from people on the front end because you haven't lived long enough. You haven't endured long enough to tell me how to survive bad times when you've only had good ones. Okay, that's like somebody who just got married 10 minutes ago and, and now you and your brand new spouse want to sit down and tell other folks uh, particularly if you've had no training or no sense of professional uh, pedagogy. Uh, I'm talking about in a context where by experience, you want to try to sit down and teach somebody else how to survive marriage. Honey, go somewhere and have a honeymoon. I want to suggest that being on the front end doesn't equip you because it does not allow you to come into the knowledge of the things that you can only learn along the journey. And some of us are struggling in life because you have people who don't understand your pain because they live on the front end and they still have that zeal and that passion and that drive that they initially had. And I'm not suggesting that, that you have to lose your passion. I'm just suggesting that life is going to do its best to take your passion and you won't know what I'm talking about until you've made it to the back end. Lord have mercy. I want to suggest that the back end is the place that you begin to question the same things that you used to answer. The back end is the place where you begin to question some of the same things that you used to answer. I used to be in a place and in a position where I thought I knew everything. Now I'm in a place and a position where I question everything because my experiences have been contrary to some of the assumptions that I thought would take place in my life. Who am I teaching to tonight who can testify you know what it's like to have to navigate through life and the pain of the conflict that occurs along the journey can leave you sometimes like it has left me in some situations on the back end questioning the very thing that I was once confirmed and was once confident that I knew was God. 
If I'm talking to you tonight, you ought to just comment about that and just type, it's the back end, it's the back end, it's the back end. It's the back end that'll get you depressed. It's the back end of it that'll cause you to be upset. It's the back end of it that'll cause you to lose your mind. It's the back end of it that'll have you in need of support and prayer. It's the back end of it. I don't need people on the front end. I might need your help on the back end. It's the back end of it that has me wondering where is God and how will I survive and how am I going to make it and how is this going to take place and and I know some of the religious people who have only lived on the front end or or, or who are in denial about the back end want to make people like you and me feel stupid for wrestling on the back end but I want to suggest that at the end of the day you can be like that man whom Jesus uh, met at the foot of that mountain who said Lord I believe but help my unbelief it doesn't mean I don't have any belief it doesn't mean I'm completely an unbeliever it doesn't mean I've backslid. John didn't walk away from God, but what it does mean is that there is a reality that causes sometimes a duality. I taught this a few months ago that 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 that, that I need remedy for my reality. That there is a reality in me that creates a duality in me and I'm not always as strong as people think. I'm sorry, church, because I hate to confess it on a live, but I want to tell you I am not always as strong as people think that sometimes I find myself frustrated too, and I find myself ready to give up like you, and I find myself ready to throw in the towel, and there but for the grace of God go with I. Uh, he said uh, in one place, the writer said, I want to suggest that, that I too, like many of you, have found myself on the back end of it, and on the back end of it, there's a level of frustration. There's a level of anxiety. There's a level. I'm talking to the people who when you first came in the pandemic, you were proclaiming the blessings of God and you were declaring just like we used to do. Some folks did in the recession in 07 and 08. You know, not me, not my house. I'm protected from the recession. And just in that same sense, some of us felt, I ain't going to have no worries. This pandemic is going away quickly. I'm not going to have any problems. Praise the Lord. My house is covered. Nothing is coming. Now my dwelling place and we quoted all of the right scriptures and maybe you haven't caught the virus called COVID but you might have caught the virus called discouragement, the, the virus called anxiety, the virus called uh, depression the virus called fear or worry and my point is that perhaps, y'all ready for this maybe the saints are not as exempt from life as we think we are and that grace isn't about exemption grace is about sufficiency to handle reality he said my grace is sufficient for my strength is made perfect in weakness my strength isn't designed to keep you from weakness my strength is designed to perfect you in weakness and what i'm telling you is that maybe just maybe you Two will have to experience life on the back end. Lord, have mercy. So then my question becomes, let me hasten. My question then becomes, as we examine John's situation, then how do we manage the back end? And I'm going to give you a couple of things. I'm going to let you go tonight. I pray this is blessing somebody. I want to suggest, number one, that the back end or the back end of it, however you want to look at it, is the perfect place for reinforcement. It is a place that requires reinforcement. I don't know if you caught this because it's so simple in the text, it's easy to miss. The Bible says that John, from prison, after hearing the works of Jesus, sent a few of his disciples to Jesus to ask him, are you the one who should be looked for another? Here's his principle. John couldn't get to Jesus physically, could not get to Jesus. So John, because of the condition that had him in prison, sent some of his trusted confidants. He had people in his life to provide him reinforcement and seek Jesus on his behalf. Well, 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 I want to suggest that sometimes you can find yourself imprisoned in a place where you need somebody to seek the Lord on your behalf. 
This is not deep, y'all. This is practical. But I hope you understand the revelation that God is trying to give us tonight. I'm telling you that it is possible, even with your strong self, even with your anointed self, even with your God-fearing self, that there will be seasons in your life where you will be imprisoned by something that will cause you to lack the ability to reach God on your own. There is nothing wrong with having people around you. In fact, I would admonish you need to have some people around you who can go seek Jesus when you feel like you can't reach him. Glory to God. You need somebody who can seek the Lord on your behalf. You need somebody who can go to God when you can't go to God. Somebody who can get a prayer through when you feel you can't get a prayer through. Somebody who doesn't judge you. Come on. Who's open enough and not judgmental to the point that they can accept your vulnerability and take your vulnerability to Jesus without feeling the need to pray on that vulnerability with spiritual judgment. You need somebody who can take your brokenness to the Lord and intercede as if they were you and go ask Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? Notice the question that John didn't put one person, but they have so embodied John's request that they have put themselves into it. And they said, should we look for somebody else? Because whatever, wherever John is, we're going to feel his pain. I want to suggest that each of us needs it. Who do you have in your life that is spiritual reinforcement. It might be family. It might be your pastor. It might be a spiritual leader. It might be somebody in your community. It might be a friend. It might be your spouse. It might be your child or your parent. But my question is, is there anybody in your life whom you trust, key word, whom you trust with your vulnerability enough to make them aware of your weakness so that they can take that weakness to the Lord? Now, let me Back up, rewind, and play this again. I said, is there anybody you trust enough that you share your vulnerability? You know why I bring that up? Because sometimes our tendency is to is to give more credence and respect to the people who don't know our business but picked us up in the spirit. Y'all know how we do. And so we don't tell anybody that we're going through. We expect, and God knows as a pastor, I've had to live through this in various seasons of my ministry, where there are people who are going through hell but won't tell you. And they expect you. Some of y'all have friends who do this to you. They expect you to somehow pick up in the atmosphere through a divine telegram that they're going through. And when they ask you how you're doing, then or when you ask them how they're doing, then, then they, they tell you, oh, I'm fine. When they know they're not fine, but they're not going to tell you they're not fine because they expect you. Stop doing that. Stop playing all of these games. Now, I'm not telling you to share all of your business. I'm not telling you to get on Instagram Live and to get on Facebook and just start going off telling your business. But what I'm telling you is that there ought to be somebody in your life who doesn't have to guess where you are spiritually, who doesn't have to guess where you are personally, somebody you trust enough. Praying out of personal knowledge doesn't make me less spiritual than if I prayed out of a divine knowledge. Paul said, I pray in the spirit and I pray with an understanding. It means I pray in common knowledge and common language and I turn around and pray in, some, in a language I don't understand. Prayer can exist both ways. Lord, this is good. Prayer can exist both ways. Intercession exists both ways. Intercession doesn't always have to be that somebody is oblivious to your need. There can be some things that go so wrong. You need somebody to know specifically and explicitly. This is what I need you to seek God for on my behalf. John sends them with specific instructions. You, When you go get Jesus, when you find Jesus, don't ask him how he's doing today. Don't ask him when's the next miracle. You ask him specifically, are you the one or should we look for another? Man, I'm telling you that if you don't learn how to allow reinforcements in your life, then you will not only be in prison, but you'll be in prison with no internal intervention. You'll be in prison with no glimmer of hope, in prison with no sense of courage, in prison. But the prison won't just be the bars that sit in front of you. It will be the bars that sit within you because you did not allow somebody else to seek God on your behalf. The back end requires reinforcement. Number two, the back end requires reassurance. So they get to Jesus 
And what Jesus gives them in reply to their question is reassurance. Jesus said, you go back and tell John what you hear and see. And then he goes through a list of things to which uh, they, if they had been paying attention, would have heard or saw or things that John would know. And I'm going to get into this in a minute. He says, you go tell him the things you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The dead are raised. The deaf hear. The poor have the gospel preached. Now, on one level, what he's saying is you go back and tell him the stuff you see me doing. That, that the confirmation he's looking for, let me give him reassurance by, by saying, because his question was, are you the one or should we look for another? He says, you go back and tell him the things we have seen and heard. But on a deeper level, verse 2 tells us when John was in prison, he had heard of the things Jesus had done. This then, this, uh, this, this reply that Christ gives wasn't just about um, proof in the sense of tell him what's going on right now. Jesus actually in this passage is quoting a passage out of Isaiah. Jesus is almost in code language. Jesus is speaking scripture. Okay, the vast majority of these words were from a, a, a prior scripture that John the Baptist would have known. Which means that what Jesus is literally doing is reassuring John through John's disciples with the word of God. Come here for a minute. I want to tell you that when you find yourself on the back end, you need the reassurance of the word of God. You need a word from God, which means can I tell you that the thing the enemy wants to do probably more than anything else when you're in the uh, in the struggle on the back end of it, the enemy wants to disconnect you from the word of God. The enemy wants to convince you not to think spiritually, not to pursue God's word. That's why our Bibles are the first thing we put down usually in tribulation. We disconnect if we aren't careful from our worship and from our regimen of prayer. And I'm going to deal with regimen this Sunday, uh, but we often back away and shy away from those uh, elements that are part of our spiritual regimen, and we become desensitized to the need to remain in a spiritual place. The enemy is trying to disconnect us because the enemy knows, God said in Psalms, that God sent his word and it healed the people. The enemy knows that the word of God is able to heal and to deliver and to set free and to destroy the yoke and to release the heavy burden, that just the word from God can change a whole situation. Just just the word of God will shift the whole dynamic. Just the word of God will put people in a place and in a position that they will never be the same again. And that's the thing that the enemy fights, my brothers and sisters. That's the thing that the enemy is after. That's the thing the enemy wants to stop in your life. He wants to use discouragement to keep you from connecting with the word. If you can disconnect from the word, then the enemy figures it won't matter how much healing and blessing God is doing. You'll still be numb. He says, you, I'll make sure you don't have any sense of connection with what God is doing, which is how God could be blessing. But because the devil is messing, you yourself are stressing. It's cheesy. I know. I don't care. It felt good to say it. God could be blessing you right now. But because the devil is messing with you right now, then you don't see the blessing. You only feel the stress. And what I'm telling you is it is the trap of the enemy to keep you disconnected but the Lord's remedy is to reassure you with the word of God and what I'm here to tell you tonight is don't allow what's going wrong in your life to rob you of what God is doing right Lord Jesus don't allow what's going wrong in your life to rob you of the reality of what's going right. I'm here to tell you that regardless to what's going wrong in your life, that there indeed is something going right in your life and that God is moving in the midst of what's happening. John, I know you're in prison. I know things don't look well, but in the midst of it all, God is moving. I need somebody on my life tonight who can just be a witness and testify to give encouragement to somebody else. And if it's you, you ought to just raise that hand emoji 
told you and comment, God is moving. Let's just set the record straight. But God is moving. God is moving. The lame are walking. The lepers are being cleansed. The blind are seeing. The deaf are hearing. The poor have the gospel preached to them. The dead are being raised. God is moving. Don't you let these prison bars convince you that the Lord isn't doing anything in the earth. The Lord is moving. Glory, hallelujah. Even on the back end, even in the pandemic, even in the problem, even amidst racial, even in the midst of racial tension and, and racism running rapid in the land and social uh, and institutionalized injustice, God is still moving. That even in the midst of hatred and death and, and disease and decay, don't you be fooled about it. The Lord is still moving. And you need the word of God. You don't need another stimulus check. You need a word from God. You don't have to have more friends. You need a word from God. You don't need for another ship to come in. You need the word to reach down into the crevices of your vulnerability and to reassure you until your hope is built. Lord, let me stop because I don't have an organ in here. Until the, your hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. The back end is a place of reinforcement. The back end is a place of reassurance. And finally, I close. The back end is a place of readjustment. I got seven minutes. Let me wrap this up. The back end is the place of readjustment. Jesus finally says for the disciples to incur back to John or to, to transfer this message back to John. He said, you tell them, blessed is he who does not take offense because of me. Offense? Jesus, of all the things you could say, offense? Jesus makes this a matter of offense? Yes. Why offense? I have learned that offense is based often upon the mismanagement of disappointed expectations. Can I say that again for those of you typing it? Because I know somebody's typing it right now. That offense is often the result of mismanaged, excuse me, or is often the result of mismanaging disappointed expectations. Offense is often the result of mismanaging disappointed expectations. It's what I had in mind being crushed and the disappointment that comes through it and then the mismanagement of that disappointment that often leads to a root of bitterness and offense. Jesus in this singular final verse of our text, puts out a call for John and others, any others, to reassess and readjust what they had in mind. Now let me make it plain. I'm going to close. John says, are you the Messiah? Are you the one? Or should we look for another? Now, John, you testified in John chapter one. You testified in the previous season that he was the Messiah. Why are you questioning he's the Messiah? Maybe it's not merely about John's imprisonment, though it is. Maybe it's deeper than that. Maybe John's imprisonment and the idea that things have not turned out for John, perhaps the way John would have wanted. Maybe that has given birth to to the idea of John questioning. Is Jesus really what we've been expecting? Because what we've been expecting, if you study history, what they were expecting was a Messiah to be, their Messiah to be, a warrior, a king, someone who would come and overthrow the Roman superpower and the oppressive um, regime and then allow and set up for Israel and for Judah to, to, to sovereignly be their own people and to have their own land and to do their own thing. They, they wanted a king, and Jesus comes as a servant. And it appears to be a bit confusing here because the question is like, wait a minute, are you really the one? Because this isn't what we had in mind. Don't get me wrong. I know you coming to baptize in the Holy Ghost and fire and all of this. But, 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 but you mean tell me you got power to raise the dead, but you can't come get me out of prison? You, you mean tell me you got power to fulfill all of this amazing agenda, but, but you can't come look out for a brother? I'm getting ready to die. 
I'm on, John is on death row. It's not just that he's in prison. John is on death row and soon will be beheaded because Herod, the king's daughter, wants his head on a platter as a birthday present. I'm telling you, this is not looking good for John. And, and, and Jesus, are, are you really what I had in mind? I'm telling you that offense is birthed through the mismanagement of disappointed expectations. And Jesus, in response, says, tell John and any others of you who are listening, don't be offended at me. In other words, don't allow your, your disappointment to make you offended based upon your own messianic expectations. <laughs> He's saying you need to go back and reassess and readjust your messianic expectations. What you expected from a Messiah, maybe you need to go back and put that in the shop and reassess what it is because I did not come to fulfill what you wanted. I came to fulfill what God wanted. Oh, God, are you here what I'm teaching you tonight? I don't know who I'm teaching. And in my last few minutes, what I'm trying to tell you is that maybe the back end of it, maybe this is the perfect time for you to begin to reassess what you have been expecting from God. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't cling so closely to the promise God made and cling closer to the God who made the promise. I'm not telling you not to hold on to the promise of God. I'm telling you never hold on to a promise from God more than you hold on to God. <laughs> because what you've got, because what you might find is that the promise you feel you got from God was filtered through the lens of your own expectation and when that expectation gets shattered, then the promise gets wasted. I'm telling you that you have to indeed and in fact put your hope and your trust in the Lord and consequently maybe the back end of it is the perfect place for you to reassess what was I expecting out of this what was I looking for out of this because if you don't readjust your expectations then even fulfillment will make you just as cold as failure did you hear what I just said? I say that if you don't readjust your expectations, even fulfillment can make you just as cold as failure. Jesus was fulfilling the very thing that John prophesied and participated that Jesus would do. And yet here is John growing cold in the face of fulfillment. Because if you don't manage your expectations, even a good thing happening. Can make, this is why if you talk to some people, they'll tell you they got that new house, they got that nicer job, they got that better car, and now they've got more headaches than they had when they started. It doesn't make the thing not a blessing. What it means is that at the end of the day, I didn't manage my expectations. I didn't factor in the backside of it. I looked at the front end. I didn't consider the back end of it. I didn't realize that having children would mean, I know I wanted children so bad, I didn't consider having children meant that my life was no longer my own and I couldn't just come and go as I wanted. I know I wanted that house, but I didn't realize that a bigger house was a bigger mortgage, which means a bigger mess when things go wrong and more insurance and more opportunity for me. I didn't realize when I got that, that nicer, newer car that it was going to cost me more to maintain it. I didn't realize every blessing has a back end. And what I'm telling you is that the back end is the place that we have to readjust what we expect so that we won't be offended with God. Can I say this? And I close. I want to suggest that most people, many people at least, who walk away from the faith, don't walk away from the faith because they somehow stumbled across a, a more uh, a theological notion in another faith or a religious group. Most people who walk away from the Christian faith or walk away from the Lord don't walk away from the Lord because they awakened to some deep theological or anti-theological reality. This No, most people's, if you want to use an old term, backsliding is more rooted often in disappointment than doctrine. Most people at the root were offended of him. 
And a lot of times I had something to do with somebody who claimed to represent him. Church hurt me. People misled me. Somebody took advantage of me. Or maybe something in life happened to which I thought uh, that, that God should have been there. And what I'm really struggling with is not theology as, as in its broad context as much as I'm struggling with uh, what is called theodicy, this notion of how could a good God allow evil to happen in my life? How could you take my mama? How could you take my, how could my child be the one to die? How could my marriage end? And it's disappointment and the mismanagement of disappointment that often causes people to walk away from God. And I teach this or minister this tonight because I don't want you to end up being distant from the same God that you once proclaimed proudly. I don't want you to find yourself, my brother, my sister, slowly straying away in these pandemic times, finding yourself slowly but surely, or to use a musical term, polka a polka, piece by piece, little by little, falling away simply because of the fact that there is some measure of disappointment in life, whether it be pandemic or whether it be problematic. I don't want some external circumstance in life that has got you stuck behind imprisoned bars to make you question to the point that you walk away and that is why you have to wrestle with the back end of it you have to wrestle with the back end of it so that the back end doesn't become your end you have to wrestle with the back end of it so that you, even if things don't get better situationally that you can find yourself in a revelation that causes your spirit to be secure. You need to wrestle with this back end of it so that you don't end up working all of that and doing all of that. What profit would it gain the whole, a, a, a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? You have to be careful and wrestle with this tension on the inside so that after having led others to Christ, you yourself don't become a castaway. I'm telling you tonight. I'm telling you tonight, as sure as my name is Rousen, and as sure as God told me to minister this message, that there's somebody watching me, and you don't even realize how close to the edge you've been. If you're honest with yourself, there's somebody who should be watching me, and they are so close to the edge, you won't even tune in to watch it. You're not even present to hear it. Somebody's hearing this word, and it's not live. It's long been since I preached it, but you're just stumbling across it because at the time the message was ministered, you weren't even in the shape of mind to hear it. I'm telling you, while the water is troubled, you better jump in. You need to ask God to help you. Maybe you need some reinforcements. Some people who can go to God on your behalf. Maybe you need some reassurance. You need a word from God. You need God to reconnect you with what God has already said. Maybe you need to make some readjustments. Maybe this is the part, the role you play to, to deal with poorly managed expectations. But whatever it is, I'm challenging you to deal with it on the back end. Tonight, I want to say a word of prayer, a quick word of prayer for people who are wrestling on the back end. Who secretly are struggling and at one season you were sure and solid and you had it together and now you find yourself saying Lord what in the world I want to pray for you Lord I don't know the words to really say tonight I believe that your word has done the work but we seal this message we seal this teaching we seal this moment in prayer we bathe it in the blood of Jesus we bathe it in the blood of Jesus I intercede like those disciples went to Jesus on behalf of John, I come to you on behalf of my brothers and sisters and sons and daughters. I come to you, crying out to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we need to know, are you the one or should we look for another? We're in a place that we're wrestling. We're in a place that we need some, some reassurance. We're in a place that, 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 that we need you to speak to us and let us know that everything internally is going to be all right. Even if situations don't seem to be all right, Lord, we need your touch. 
Help us tonight, beginning tonight, to do an assessment of our own heart and to begin to readjust some expectations and in places where it is in fact our own ambition that had us convinced that things would be a certain way. I pray you will help us to make the necessary changes so that we don't fall completely out and lose our joy and lose our mind and lose our peace. Holy Ghost of God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us so that we can do what we know we need to do and be with us, heal us along this journey. In Jesus' name, it is so. Amen. If you don't know the Lord, pray with me. God, I come in Jesus' name. I confess I am a sinner, but I also confess you are the Savior. I confess that you died for my sin and that you rose for my justification. I believe that you are Lord. So tonight, I make you Savior and Lord of my life. By your grace, through my faith, I declare I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen. You accepted Christ as your Savior. Perhaps if you rededicated your life to Christ or if you're looking to become a part of our church family, click that, that link at the bottom of the screen and communicate with us and let us know. We want to walk you in your next step in your spiritual journey. Finally, if you want to be a blessing to the ministry, as I mentioned before, you have the ability, the information is at the bottom of your screen. You have an opportunity to do it, to do that. And we thank you for every contribution. But most of all, I want you to leave with this word on your mind. Go back and replay it if you have to. Do what you've got to do. Make sure you survive the back end.